it was the last of the gunfighters. In many other ways, America's Vought F-8 Crusader represented a departure from the conventional. Its strikingly unorthodox figure, characterized by its unique variable incidence wings and sleek silhouette, challenged the status quo with its innovative design. Its futuristic features made the Crusader a beauty to behold and a beast in performance, shattering expectations by becoming the first jet fighter in American service to break the 1,000 miles per hour barrier in level flight. In its reconnaissance role in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the F-8 Crusader helped avert nuclear annihilation. The F-8 then went on to prove its mettle as a tenacious dogfighter against the MiG-17 and MiG-21 in the turbulent skies over Vietnam, racking up the best victory ratio of any U.S. aircraft type during the war, as well as demonstrating its capabilities for devastating ground attack missions. This enduring legacy is crowned by its remarkable achievement of 20 years of service, a testament to its exceptional design and versatility in an era when Navy fighters were frequently replaced. The origins of the Vought F-8 Crusader stem from the issuing of a requirement for a new fighter by the U.S. Navy in September 1952, in the midst of the Korean War. The star of Communist North Korea's Air Force was the Soviet-built MiG-15, a highly advanced fighter that was faster, more robust, and better armed than most of its American counterparts. In order to stand a chance against this tough opponent, the Navy knew it needed an aircraft with higher velocity and deadlier weapons. To this end, the requirement demanded a top speed of at least Mach 1.2 at an altitude of 30,000 feet, with a climb rate of 25,000 feet per minute and a maximum landing speed of 100 miles per hour. It also stipulated the rejection of the .50 caliber machine guns used by many U.S. fighters of the day in favor of more powerful 20mm cannons, which the Navy was already using in its other aircraft. Stepping up to the challenge, aircraft manufacturer Vought got to work designing a carrier-based fighter to fit the Navy's specifications. Spearheaded by John Russell Clark, Vought's design team chose a distinctive approach for their fighter, initially known as the V-383. Its wings were mounted much higher than usual, improving lift and stability and allowing for greater clearance between the aircraft's fuselage and the carrier deck during takeoff and landing, reducing the risk of damage. This configuration also facilitated the storage of larger, more effective landing gear within the fuselage, crucial for the harsh landing conditions experienced on aircraft carriers. However, the most interesting thing about the fighter's wings was not their placement, but the fact that they had an adjustable angle of incidence relative to the fuselage. Known as a variable incidence wing, this groundbreaking design enabled the wing to pivot upwards by 7 degrees during takeoff and landing without tilting the entire aircraft upwards, improving pilot visibility during these critical phases and ensuring a slow, safe landing speed. At the same time, the wings allowed for the downward adjustment of their leading edge flaps by 25 degrees and the extension of their inboard flaps to 30 degrees, changing their aerodynamic shape to further enhance the aircraft's lift. In addition, Vought's design incorporated several other state-of-the-art features, including a fuselage designed with area ruling for reduced drag at transonic speeds, fully movable horizontal tail surfaces known as stabilators for pitch control, notched wing edges to improve stability during turns, and extensive use of titanium to strengthen its structure without adding unnecessary weight. The aircraft was powered by a Pratt & Whitney J57, one of the first successful axial flow turbojet engines. Unlike earlier designs in an axial flow engine, air flows parallel to the axis of rotation, which allows for a more compact engine structure and efficient airflow dynamics resulting in higher compression ratios and greater thrust. The engine also came equipped with an afterburner a device that injects fuel directly into the exhaust stream of the engine, igniting it to provide additional thrust. This feature was particularly useful for military aircraft, 
providing a significant boost in power when needed, such as during takeoff from aircraft carriers, rapid climbs, and in combat situations requiring high-speed maneuvers. Meeting the Navy's armament requirements, Vought's proposal was outfitted with four 20mm autocannons as its main weaponry, capable of firing explosive shells as well as solid projectiles at a rapid rate. These cannons meant that the fighter would not only be effective against airborne opponents, but could also be used for strafing runs against ground targets. The aircraft was also equipped with a retractable tray capable of holding 32 unguided Mark IV Mark 40 folding fin aerial rockets, nicknamed Mickey Mouse rockets. Despite being small and unguided, these could be fired in rapid succession, and when launched in volleys, they could saturate a target area, increasing the likelihood of a hit on the intended target. The retractable tray mechanism was a novel idea that allowed for the storage of the rockets within the aircraft's fuselage, keeping them aerodynamically stowed until needed, helping maintain the aircraft's sleek profile and reduce drag. What's more, for increased air-to-air -air combat abilities, Vought's fighter was also designed to carry two infrared-guided AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, renowned for their ability to lock on to the heat signature of enemy aircraft by seeking out the target's engine exhaust, allowing the pilot to engage opponents beyond visual range and without the need for precise aiming that guns require. For extra aerodynamic efficiency and to minimize interference with the aircraft's radar and other systems, these were mounted on special points located near the cockpit area on the sides of the aircraft's fuselage called cheek pylons because they somewhat resembled cheeks. These pylons allowed for quick and easy attachment of the missiles, ensuring that they could be deployed rapidly in battle. This impressive design would help propel Vought's proposal to victory, winning the Navy contract in May 1953. With the aircraft now given the official designation F-8U-1, Vought received an order for three prototypes the following month. Confidence in the success of the first prototype was extremely high by the time it took to the skies on March 25, 1955, so much so that pilot John Conrad even broke the sound barrier during the aircraft's maiden flight. The development process of the aircraft went smoothly enabling both the second prototype and the initial production model of the F-8U-1 to take to the skies for their maiden flights on the same day, September 30, 1955. 1956 would prove a milestone year for the F-8U-1, beginning with the successful completion of its inaugural catapult launch from the USS Forrestal on April 4. Meanwhile, armament development took place at the Naval Air Weapons Station China Lake in California, where, on August 21st, Commander Duke Windsor achieved a level flight speed of 1,015.428 miles per hour. While this record did not surpass the world speed record held by the British Ferry Delta, two since March 10, 1956, it did set a national speed record in the USA surpassing a previous mark of 822 miles per hour set by an F-100 from the Air Force. Rounding off the year's successes, the aircraft's development team was awarded the prestigious Collier Trophy, an annual award given by the National Aeronautic Association to recognize the greatest achievement in American aviation design. However, instead of resting on their laurels, the team continued working hard on the aircraft's development. Before long, they had adapted an early version of the F-8U-1 Crusader for photo reconnaissance by fitting it with photographic equipment instead of traditional armaments, creating the first F-8U-1P. On July 16, 1957, Major John H. Glenn, Jr., a Marine Corps pilot, made history in an F-8U-1P by flying across the United States from California to New York at supersonic speeds, completing the coast-to-coast -coast journey in 3 hours, 23 minutes, and 8.3 seconds. With the assignment of the F-8U-1 to various units from late 1956 onwards, its operational use would begin aboard USS Franklin D. Roosevelt in April 1957. Before long, it would also join VF-32 at NAS Cecil Field, Florida, which became the first fleet squadron to pilot the aircraft. 
Deploying on USS Saratoga to the Mediterranean later that year, VF-32 called its F-8U-1 squadron Swordsman, a reference to the aircraft's official Crusader nickname, which was now in use. Soon enough, more and more units in various theaters were forming Crusader squadrons, which typically took on the role of day fighters. Despite rapid advancements in engines and avionics leading to frequent updates in the aircraft used by Navy carriers, the Crusader became the first post-Korean warfighter to successfully carve out a more lasting place within the fleet, enjoying a notably extended service period. Meanwhile, the French Navy also incorporated a slightly modified version of the Crusader into its fleet. In September 1962, the Defense Department unified aircraft designation systems in line with the Air Force's approach, leading to the F-8U's rebranding as the F-8, with the original F-8U-1 becoming known as the F-8A and the F-8U-1P reconnaissance aircraft becoming the RF-8A. This latter model hit the headlines the following month for its significant role in the 13-day standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. Having proved their adeptness at taking detailed photographs at low altitudes, several RF-8As flew a series of highly dangerous low-level photo reconnaissance missions over Cuba, managing to record evidence of Soviet medium-range ballistic missiles on the island. This provided U.S. President John F. Kennedy with undeniable proof of the enemy's activities, which would be crucial for the tense diplomatic negotiations that followed. The world breathed a sigh of relief as the crisis eventually ended on October 29, 1962, with the Soviet Union agreeing to withdraw the missiles, a process that was also overseen by RF-8As. For their part in helping to narrowly avoid the catastrophic consequences that a further escalation of the conflict could have entailed, the pilots who performed these missions were awarded distinguished flying crosses, while the units they belonged to were recognized with the prestigious U.S. Navy Unit Commendation. Less than three years later, as U.S. military presence in Vietnam increased, the F-8A would finally get its first taste of combat. While some believe the age of the dogfight was over, suggesting that air-to-air -air missiles would eliminate opposing aircraft long before they could get near enough to engage in close-quarters combat, this theory was soon proved wrong. On April 3, 1965, U.S. Navy Crusaders from USS Hancock took on a North Vietnamese fighter squadron, marking the first of many clashes over the Southeast Asian skies in the tumultuous years that followed. Though the Crusader had been created to rival the MiG-15, the North Vietnamese were now flying the more advanced MiG-17. To add to the challenge, the Crusaders often had to engage with the agile MiGs without the advantage of radar-initiated contact. Instead, pilots depended on ground-based controllers to locate the enemy and guide them to strategic attack positions. Typically, missions involve two F-8 fighters, with one pilot handling radar and navigation while the other visually scanned for threats. Directed by ground control to unsuspecting enemy fighters, they'd swiftly move in for the attack. Meanwhile, the constant threat of U.S. surface-to-air missiles would force the MiGs to fly at lower altitudes, where the F-8's superior maneuverability gave it an edge. As the war advanced, the F-8 Crusader would come up against an even more advanced opponent, the MiG-21. Nevertheless, effective teamwork and strategic exploitation of the Soviet-built fighters' vulnerabilities allowed the F-8 to remain a competent adversary in aerial combat, as proven on August 1, 1968. In the chaos of battle, Notorious North Vietnamese flying ace and Guyan Hong Ni attacked a pair of Crusaders using R-3 anti-aircraft missiles, managing a direct hit on one before going after the other. As the two fighters were locked in an intense dogfight, another two F-8S arrived on the scene to rescue their comrade. As the MiG received a deadly blow from a Sidewinder missile, Nguyen was forced to eject. The downing of the ace was credited to Lt. McCoy of VF-51 from USS Bonhomme Richard. Interestingly, most of the F-8's other victories in Vietnam were also achieved with its sidewinders, 
Despite its famous Last of the Gunfighters nickname, only four enemy aircraft were taken down using its 20mm cannons, which often suffered from a jammed feeding mechanism. With the end of Operation Rolling Thunder later that year, the dogfighting period of Vietnam essentially ended, leaving the Crusader with the war's best victory ratio of any U.S. aircraft, downing 16 MiG-17 and 3 MiG-21 fighters to give a total of 19 against just three losses. As the Vietnam War dragged on, the F-8 took on a new role as a bomb truck, focusing its attacks on ground targets instead. At the same time, back in the United States, the Crusader caught the attention of NASA, which used modified versions of the aircraft to test some of its most groundbreaking new technologies. These included digital fly-by-wire systems, which utilized processing equipment from the Apollo guidance computer, and supercritical wing designs that later contributed to advancements in aircraft performance and efficiency. With the Vietnam War finally coming to an end in 1975, the U.S. Navy retired its last Crusader fighter models the following year, marking the end of nearly 20 years of service, a new record for the longevity of a Navy fighter. Many of the retired F-8S were bought by the Philippines, who incorporated them into the 7th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Basa Air Base, from which would intercept Soviet bombers and escort presidential flights. Meanwhile, the photo reconnaissance version of the Crusader continued in service in the U.S. well into the following decade, with the last operational unit turned over to the National Air and Space Museum in 1987. With a long and varied career, the Crusader's significant contribution to aviation history and the high regard in which it is held is perhaps best summed up through the famous message written on its pilot's insignia. Quote, when you're out of F-80S, you're out of fighters. <laughs>